Tonight's service is going to be broadcast across the state of Arkansas and all of our outlets. We broadcast several times a week in El Dorado, Camden, and various cable networks. We also broadcast on VTN four times a week out of Little Rock. And uh, as a matter of fact, right now I just finished preaching on Golden Eagle Broadcasting, which is the old Roberts University Broadcasting Network nationwide. But this particular message tonight is going to go across the state of Arkansas and across this region, and it's on a very, very important subject. And so tonight I want to, as pastor of Cross Life Church, I want to just thank our television viewing audience for tuning in to this very, very timely word. On January the 18th, we celebrate and we commemorate and we use that day to challenge God's people to come back to the fundamental truth that all life is sacred. From the moment of conception, that child, and it is a child, not a fetus, is a living creation of God. And I have tried for 28 years to be as brutally honest, championing the cause of the preservation of innocent unborn children across this country and I'm not alone. There are heroes in our country like David and Deborah Griffin. David and Deborah Griffin joined this church about 20 years ago. The very day that I took this church as pastor, they joined this church and they have not left. And I want to tell you, I thank God that they didn't. David Griffin was used of the Holy Spirit back in the early days of this church to bring a a supernatural day of repentance. I'll never forget, nothing had ever quite happened like that in this church when he asked to take the microphone. He took the microphone that day and he began to just shake under the power of God and began to call this church to repentance and to the Holy Spirit and call this church to the supernatural. And a spirit of repentance broke out in this church. I'll never forget it. It was people just, I never got to preach that day. That's probably the first time as pastor in what was then Second Baptist Church, I never got to preach because the big preacher showed up. And God used this, this deacon and this elder in this church to birth something that has continued to grow. And I love David Griffin. I love Deborah, his wife, and I love what she stands for. In the year 2000, she, along with some other people in our community, gave birth to the Hanna Medical Center, not only in El Dorado, but in a three-county region. The Hanna Medical Center ministers in El Dorado and Camden and Magnolia and to all of the women and the families in this region. It was her vision, it was her passion and her drive because it's one thing to stand up and curse the darkness of abortion, but it's quite a different thing to light a light and give women a choice and give them hope, give them information, give them healing, give them help, to give them an opportunity, even if they have experienced an abortion in their life, to know that Jesus forgives and that there is a second chance and the blood of Jesus can cover the multitude of sin. And so Deborah Griffin, along with some other precious people in this region, gave birth to the Hannah Medical Center in El Dorado in the year 2000. She served as the executive director there until 2009 when under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, she moved into a different realm of ministry, uh, sharing the message of the protection of the sacred unborn. They minister there in the Hannah Medical Center to 60 to 70 women who are in the middle of making a decision whether to give the child life or take the life through abortion. And I know that there are many, many, supernatural miracles of children being rescued as a result of this ministry. Cross Life Church has given thousands and thousands of dollars to this ministry and I, I would just like to brag on you and say because of your faithfulness in tithing, we are actually right now the largest donor to this ministry of any church in this region. So you ought to just give yourself a hand clap for that. 3,000 teenagers a year were taught abstinence education and that they have a choice and that choice is to wait until they get married to have sex because that's God's choice. That's God's choice. And 
So we just thank God for the Hannah Medical Center and we thank God for the vision that God gave Deborah Griffin along with many other people and for the great leadership she's provided over these years. So as you watch on television uh, today or this evening or whatever time you may be seeing this, we want you to celebrate life with us. And I want you to give a big welcome to our member and our friend, Miss Deborah Griffin. Give her a big welcome tonight as she comes. Thank you, Deborah. And see, you drew a bigger crowd than I would have. It was empty to begin with. <laughs> kind of made me nervous. I said, you didn't even advertise I was gonna be here and I made it empty. Pretty good. Um, Brother Dwayne uh, did a great intro. I've never been called a hero before. Thank you very much. I think half of that was because I'm married to David, but I'll take it. Um, I cannot seem to start a speech without telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I became pro-life I guess the day I was born. I don't ever remember not being pro-life. Before I got saved, I was pro-life. Uh, Y'all may or may not know that Roe v. Wade uh, was passed 41 years ago in 1973. I was 13 years old. 10 years later on the anniversary, a group of people and I decided to go to Baton Rouge and participate on the march on the Capitol. I was living in Louisiana at the time. And that's my first act that I remember in being pro-life. But when I was asked to go, they said, well, are you pro-life or pro-choice? And I said, pro-life? I didn't even have to think. I just knew it was a baby. But um, the fact that it was passed when I was 13 years old today, I got to looking up facts and figures and information, and I realized I don't know as much as I think I do. So if I can, I don't want to confuse you with statistics today, but for those of you who are younger, who may have never lived before Roe v. Wade, I want to tell you what it was. Prior to Roe v. Wade, it's a legal decision. Uh, prior to that legal decision, states got to decide what happened in their state in regards to abortion, and it was illegal in most places. Roe v. Wade made abortion a federal issue across the nation. It became legal to have abortions, and since that time, millions of babies have lost their lives. But what I want to talk to you about tonight, and I'll get to it in a little bit more depth later, is that millions of women were harmed through those abortions. For years and years, <clears throat> we've worried about the babies. And the babies are very important, but we've forgotten about the women. And I'm going to talk to you more about that. I want to say a little bit more about Hannah Medical Center. It's now called Hannah Pregnancy Resource Center. And you're going to get a chance in this church in a little bit to participate in what's called the Baby Bottle Campaign. We're going to ask you to take home a baby bottle, fill it up with your change, return it to the center, and they'll turn it in. When I left, I, I don't know what the budget is now, but when I left, we were spending $250,000 a year trying to get the information out to the kids about abstinence until marriage. That was our prevention part of the ministry. Trying to minister to women at the point in time when they were having to make a decision to choose life. That was the intervention part. And then also um, we had redemptive ministries, which were, regardless of her choice, parenting, abortion, or adoption, that she knew that Jesus Christ loved her. And I think that that's where we fail often as a church in letting him know, her know that we love her. Again, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. So when you get that chance, participate in the Baby Bottle Campaign. I have, um, like, as I said, started in 1983 participating through National Right to Life. I have participated through Arkansas Right to Life. I have participated through Hannah Medical Center and many other areas in promoting life. And so um, the battle is being fought on two fronts. We want to change the laws. We want it to say it's not right. You can't just go out and do that because we make bad decisions. And by legalizing it, it looks like, well, okay, if it's legal, it must be okay. It must be all right. There must not be a problem. The second front is when that woman is making that decision. And that's where the pregnancy centers come in. It's not about what the law says. At this point in time, the law says it's legal. But when she's trying to make that decision, we want to be there to help her understand exactly what that means. And because this is an informed church, and because Brother Dwayne has preached for years on what abortion is, I'm not going there. We know what it is. We know what happens. But um, <clears throat> these two fronts are constantly battling to make the difference in saving lives. And so you, as a Christian, need to choose one or both and get involved because it does make a difference. Now, statistical disclaimer. 
You can take any statistic and make it look like you want, any old way you want to. I spent all afternoon, and I've done this for several weeks now, just get on there and read. And every time I'd read, you'd find a study that says something different than the previous study and something different than the previous study. I found some um, reliable sources, and we'll throw up that source later for you um, in the slides, of um, statistics that I'm going to share with you tonight. So on slide number one, we're going to talk about abortion and the breast cancer leak. Link, not leak, link. <laughs> Abortion hurts women. The first thing it does is it exposes them to um, the susceptibility of having breast cancer. Um, many of you may or may not know, and it's not a challenged fact in the medical world, that a woman who carries a pregnancy to term has a, a greater immunity, I guess we'll say, or less risk for breast cancer than a woman who's never been pregnant. That's not, that's not debatable. That is a scientific fact. The second, and so that's called the protective effect of childbearing. This is kind of neat. They put it up there. I don't really have to look down here. <laughs> Sorry. I hadn't done this in a while. Um, the second factor that is highly debated is whether abortion induced or spontaneous leaves a woman, a woman with more cancer vulnerable cells. 80% of the studies show that it does. 20% of the studies that show that it don't, doesn't are um, in that statistical maneuvering area. Um, when we show you the resources later on, you'll get to see where I got my facts. Please feel free to get on there and read all the statistics, the studies that you want. They tell how they structured the study, who participated in the study, why the study's good, why the study's bad. Take it from me. There's a lot of information out there. But what happens, and this makes sense if you think about it, when you're pregnant, when a woman's pregnant, her uh, breast cells start to change to prepare for um, that pregnancy to go to completion. So when the pregnancy is interrupted, whether it is spontaneous, which we call a miscarriage, or um, induced, which we call an abortion, that hormonal change is abruptly cut off and it leaves those cells, those, press, those breast cells, more susceptible to breast cancer. So if you think about it from that standpoint and you don't want to get into the studies and you don't want to get into the statistical anomalies and, and read all of that, just know that it does make a difference. There is a link between abortion and breast cancer. Feel free to look it up later. All right, on the second slide I want to talk to you about is abortion increases mental health problems in women by 81% overall. Overall, 81% of the women who had an abortion have mental health issues, okay? 34% have an increase for anxiety disorder. 37% will have greater risk of depression. And we know medically that depression in women and men but uh, can lead to cardiovascular and immune system diseases. 110% greater risk of alcohol abuse. A woman who has an abortion is 110% more likely to suffer from alcohol abuse. 110% of those women have that um, exposure. 220% greater risk of marijuana use slash abuse. And there's open debate on that, but obviously uh, most of us think, no, agree, marijuana is a gateway drug. There is 155% greater risk of an attempting to commit suicide. How is any of this good for women? None of it is good for women, and it's all linked directly to abortion. All right, if we'll throw up that third slide. Abortion increases long-term physical health problems in women. Women with a history of induced abortion are more likely to experience metabolic syndrome. Let me tell you what that is. It's a name, metabolic syndrome is a name for a group of risk factors that occur together. And the two factors are central obesity and insulin resistance. When that happens, um, they have more likelihood of having cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and stroke. These are long-term physical problems that women are going to have from abortion. And the second point is over an eight-year period, which was studied, women who aborted had a 446% higher risk of death from cerebrovascular disease which is a group of brain dysfunctions related to disease of the blood vessels supplying the brain. Hypertension is the most important one, high blood pressure. 
So these are just some of the statistics that I pulled out that I wanted to share with what abortion does to women. We're not even talking about the baby. We're talking about the woman. For 41 years, society has lied to women and said there's not a problem. It's a fetus. It's just tissue. There are no consequences. It's okay. You can do it. It's not a problem. There are mental consequences, emotional consequences, physical consequences, and spiritual consequences. I'm just going to run through a list of some of the consequences we know. (laughs) Besides those, I just gave you numbers for. Ectopic pregnancies, repeat abortions, teen depression, preterm births in future pregnancies, abusive relationships, sleep disorders, sterility, cervical damage, problems carrying future pregnancies to term, higher maternal death rate. More women die after abortions than we expect. So it's not a non-issue. It's very much an issue. We're harming women. We're stealing the lives of innocent babies and we're harming women. So, gonna do a little thing here. I'd like for all the females on this side of the room to stand up, please. Statistically, this many women in our church have had an abortion. Statistically, one out of three women, and that's not exactly right because this section is larger. It's just a little experiment. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. I'd like for all the men on this side of the church to stand up. For every woman that's been affected by an abortion, a man has been affected by an abortion. Thank you. Because they didn't get pregnant by themselves. I'd like for everybody in the middle to stand up, male or female. This is how many parents and siblings and grandparents have been affected by abortion. Thank you. Statistically. Statistically, there's probably not one person in our church who hasn't been touched by abortion in some way. Earlier this afternoon, I posted online that I was going to be speaking tonight and to please pray for post-abortive women and for me. Immediately, I was contacted by three women privately who shared that they've had an abortion. What I wanted to talk to you tonight about is the redemptive ministries We need women who've had an abortion to know that they are loved, to know that God loves them, to know that we love them. So I'm going to ask you another question, and you can raise your hand if you want to, and you don't have to. Does anybody out here know one person who has said, Woo! I am so glad I had that abortion. Best day of my life. Okay, we have one. That's unusual. I've not seen that before. All right, does anybody know anybody who said, you know, that wasn't that bad. I'm glad I had that abortion. I didn't have to go through that pregnancy. Okay, we've had one of those. Okay, we've got a a different crowd in here tonight. Most people who have had an abortion regret that abortion. In my nine years of ministering at the Hannah Medical Center, I did not meet one post-abortive woman who was glad about that decision unless they were in the first five to ten years after that abortion. Does anybody have any idea why it takes a woman five to ten years to heal from an abortion? Pride, fear, regret. Nobody wants to stay up and stand up and say, Well, I killed my child. I took the life of that baby. And we as church members don't watch what we say. And even tonight, I pray that as I Speak that you know if you're post-abortive that you are loved. And I'm probably going to use some words that are going to hurt you, and I'm sorry. Abortion is murder. It takes the life of an innocent child. But that baby is now in heaven. And more than that, abortion has left a devastated woman behind who is afraid to tell the people that she loves in Christ that she had an abortion because she's going to be judged. One of the women that contacted me this morning, this afternoon, said, well, are you post-abortive? Because I didn't know that, blah, 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 blah. No, I'm not post-abortive. 
but this has been my passion and my heart for so long. And for so long we have fought for those babies. And it is time for us to fight for those women. It is time for a woman to be able to stand up freely in church and say, I sinned, I made a mistake. Well, guess what? I don't think there's a sin-free person in here. I'm not sin-free. <laughs> Women are impacted forever. They are always going to remember Several different times on Mother's Day, I have um, emailed Brother Dwayne and said, please, please, let's remember to pray for those women who chose adoption. They're mothers without their children. And this year, it dawned on me, you know what? Every mother that chose abortion is still a mother. She chose to end that life because Satan deceived her. And guess what? We as a church jumped in and helped her. Because we didn't tell the truth. For 41 years, we have let these laws stand that say it's okay. And it's not okay. And it's hurtful and it's harmful. And I told Brother Dwayne it'll either be 10 minutes or it'll be 40. It looks like it's going to be 10. <laughs> I'm just about done. I'm here today. I want to tell you a little story. When I first started at the Hannah Medical Center, I had a prayer. I said, Lord, please, please, please don't let some child walk in that I know. Don't let some girl that I know walk in. I do not want to have to make a decision about upholding the standards of excellence that we had at the um, pregnancy center for confidentiality versus my need as a Christian to tell her mama and her daddy and say, you got to come love on this child. Don't let her make this decision without you. Please, Lord, don't put me in that position. And God is so good because somebody I knew did come through the doors and I wasn't there. Several weeks later, her mother said, my daughter came through your doors and she was loved on and she's decided to carry this pregnancy to term. I don't know if she was abortion minded. For all I know, she just needed a non-judgmental ear to listen. But God is so good because <laughs> several years ago, she started coming to our church. Several years after that, her daughter ended up in my husband's Sunday school class. So it's just a redemptive story. It goes full circle. When we love on other people, they can come to know the Lord. We're supposed to show love. We're not supposed to be judgmental. Excuse me. I have a few other harsh words to say, and, and I'm sorry. Apologize ahead of time. If you told me you are just fat and gray-haired, but if you come to our church, God's going to love on you, I would not walk through those doors. If you called me a fag and said, you're living the wrong life story, you're a fag, I would not walk through those doors. We must be careful of our words. We must love on people regardless of the decisions that they've made. And so my heart over these last few years has just changed. When I worked at the, the pregnancy center and, and you work with a good bit of the volunteers that are drawn to that are post-abortive women. And they come and they tell you their stories and they tell you their circumstances and you realize, oh my gosh. And you learn real quick to be careful what you say, real quick. So I want to challenge all of you to remember a third of these women in this church have had an abortion, and you don't know who they are. And I challenge our staff, our deacons, our elders, our Sunday school leaders, and us, each one of us, to have dialogue about the situation so that a woman can feel loved and say, well, you know, I made that decision one time and not be afraid that she's going to be pounced upon because she was selfish, because she was self-centered, because you don't know what shoes she's walked in, you don't know what her circumstances are, and she needs to be loved, okay? All right, if you'll throw that third slide up here, last fourth, I think this is the fourth, um, I can't read that far. Afterabortion.org and abortionrisk.org and National Right to Life, which is nrlc.org, where I got most of the statistics I shared with you tonight. There are always people on one side and there's people on the other side, and statistics can be manipulated. So I shared with you what I've spent weeks and years studying. Go read it yourself. <laughs> Hannah Pregnancy Resource Center is hannahprc.com. Arkansas Right to Life is ARLTARTL.org. And if you want to reach me, that's in blue. Can y'all read that? 
d.griffin at craftedlocally.com. If you are a post abortive woman and care to contact me, you can do that. I'm on Facebook. Um, and by the way, for those of you who say Facebook stinks, let me just tell you, I spent all afternoon ministering through Facebook. So there, it can be used for good. But also check out saveone.org if you're a post-abortive. And if you are a post-abortive man, if you've ever driven a woman to an abortion or peer pressured her into an abortion, uh, Save One has some studies for men also. I'd like everybody to close their eyes for a minute while I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just love you and adore you and thank you for who you are. And I thank you so much for your son. I thank you for the passion for this ministry. Lord, I want every woman who's ever had an abortion to remember 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ knew what circumstances she would find herself in, what choices she would make, and he allowed himself to be placed on that cross for her, that he died so that we might live and have everlasting life. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I want to say to our television audience that uh, Miss Deborah Griffin is available to come and speak at banquets, churches, uh, functions for your young people, anything that you'd like to give information to women about to empower them. And um, I think over 20 years of being here, and I know over 28 years of preaching, that I have somewhat tempered my rhetoric in regard to abortion and certainly I'm thankful to pastor a church that accepts people as they are in whatever state they're in whether they be post-abortive whether they be homosexual or lesbian or drug addict or alcoholic you can come to Cross Life Church and be loved and love to Jesus because that's what it's all about took the same blood to forgive me that it takes to forgive you, and he can forgive, hallelujah. At the same time, I want you to know that in the state of Arkansas, because of the bravery, the absolute bravery of some of our state legislators, like Senator Jason Rapert of Conway, Arkansas, Arkansas passed and was the first state to pass one of the most aggressive anti-abortion legislations in the nation. You know, I'm not a political party person. I'm a Christian. I'm not registered as a Republican or a Democrat because I use the Holy Spirit and the Bible to tell me how to vote. And a lot of times in Arkansas, we have uh, lost sight of the fact that since um, uh, realignment, if you will, after the Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, Arkansas has always been controlled by the Democratic Party. And in my grandpa's time, both my grandfathers are with Jesus now, but in their day, that was actually a, probably a really good thing. But over the years, that party began to really turn and take issues like abortion and make a platform out of it, began to drive a wedge between people, even Christian people. And for the first time since the Civil War, Arkansas's legislature became controlled by Republicans. Now again, I'm not a Republican, but the Republican platform has always been pro-life and saving the life of unborn children. While the Democratic platform since Roe v. Wade has very aggressively been pro-abortion and pro-choice. Well, because Arkansas was controlled by conservatives, we passed that law and was the first state to pass that it is against the law right now to abort a baby after 12 weeks of pregnancy. After 12 weeks of carrying a child, it's against the law. You can't legally have abortion in Arkansas. Now, if I had my way, you would never be able to have an abortion from the moment of conception. After that law, other states began to get on board and even states have backed that down to even 10 weeks and I think there's even one that's six weeks. But Arkansas led the way. And uh, here's my challenge to you. You're going to elect a new governor this year. You're going to elect legislators this year. Don't be deceived by television commercials. You're gonna elect a, new st a national representative, a senator, 
Don't be deceived. Just because a guy gets on TV and holds a Bible and says, this guides my life, hey, go look at how he votes. Go look at how he votes on the subject of abortion. Ladies and gentlemen, if a man votes to legalize the murder of an unborn child, do you trust him to have your well-being at heart? And in America, we have got to stop voting for political parties and we've got to stop voting for some good old boy because we knew his daddy way back when. And we've got to stop voting for people just because they're a Democrat and I'm a Democrat. And always, you know, we've got to vote for people who hold the values of the Word of God. I'm a person who has fought for racial equality in this city for 20 years. I have absolutely stood toe to toe with the Klan who still exists in this city and who did exist. I have stood across the street from the Klan when it holds rallies. I have been threatened to be bombed and murdered standing for racial equality. But the thing that we never seem to say in Arkansas and in the South is the greatest threat to an African-American child or Hispanic child is that that child will never be carried to term in the mother's womb because abortion is an epidemic among minority communities. And I say in love, we've got to educate minorities in Arkansas to understand that your child was created by God and is a gift, hallelujah. And we've got to also educate Arkansans to adopt children and to bring these children when they can't be kept in the home, maybe a young teenage girl finds herself in trouble. Let me tell you, there are people all over this state that are begging to have a child in their life who can't have one on their own. So there are all these alternatives. Chances are, you pray for me, but chances are, as we get close to the election, I tend to kind of get irritated with liberal people who are running for office and they tell lies on television. I tend to get up on television and tell the truth about them and how they are on abortion. Because I'm gonna be honest with you, I really don't care too much about what they believe about anything else. Abortion, like people say to me, you're a one issue preacher and voter. Yes, it's life. It's not politics, it's a person. It's a human being created by God. We cannot ask God to bless a nation that has the innocent blood of over 40 million children on our hands. Look at what he did to ancient Israel when they would take their newborn babies and throw them to the god Molech. And you would say, well, but that child was born. But that child in that womb is a child. We've seen time and time again women carry a child to 25, six weeks, and that child be born, and, and that child live and thrive. And I'm a parent of premature twins who have prospered well. This is a life. So I just wanna encourage you to know that you have the opportunity this November, you have the opportunity when you go to the polls and vote, I'm not telling you who to vote for. Legally, I can't do that and keep a 501c3 status with the IRS. But I can tell you this, you find out what they believe about abortion and you vote for people who will stand up for life and God will bless this state and God will bless you. Find out how they feel about that one subject and let that be your guide. Because I'm gonna tell you, we have the opportunity to elect a senator. We have the opportunity to elect a governor. We have the opportunity to reelect state representatives who will keep this a pro-life state. And hopefully, hopefully, move that from 12 weeks to zero and say if a woman's pregnant in Arkansas, she cannot legally murder her child. I'm telling you, that's what I believe in, believe for, and pray for because God's favor will be on this state. God's favor will be on this state. And um, so I want to encourage you. I really want to encourage you to talk. Um, I have spoken personally, face-to-face, -face with those people running for office this fall. If you want to know what they told me, I'll tell you privately exactly what they said about this subject because they differ both candidates from governor totally differ on this subject. 
All right, candidates for senator differ on this subject. You want to know what they said? Come see me. I don't mind telling you at all. As a matter of fact, if I had the money, I think I'll take out a full page in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and tell the state what they said so that the lies told on television are not clouded with political rhetoric. I'm going to stand before Jesus one day. And you know what? I'm going to be judged on what I have preached to you. And you're going to be judged on what you did with it. There's a lot of people who say they love Jesus, and maybe they do, who are going to stand before Jesus one day, who elected liberal presidents, congressmen, politicians, governors, and they voted for people because it padded their pocketbook and they murdered children in the process. And I'm telling you, judgment day is not going to be kind to a lot of folks. To a lot of folks. They are more than the child. Listen to this. They're harming women. The message of all the liberal organizations that want to say that they're defending the rights of women are lying to women because they're not telling women what she told you tonight. That if you have an abortion, chances of you getting cancer go up. If you have an abortion, becoming an alcoholic is a likelihood. I mean, where are they telling women that if they love women, Planned Parenthood, if they love women, they would be telling women the truth and not getting the IRS to sue churches and preachers because we're trying to protect life. Anyway, that's enough preaching for tonight. I love you. If you've had an abortion, and the chances are one out of every three women here tonight has had one, you're loved. You can be forgiven if you're not already forgiven. We will minister to you, love you. This lady will love you, pray for you, minister to you. This staff will love you and pray for you and minister to you. This church will love you and pray for you and, minister, and help the Holy Spirit heal your broken heart. We want you to be made whole. Hey, the gospel makes us whole. And if you have a hole in your heart, the Holy Spirit can fill it. Praise God. And we want you to be made whole. So come see us. I'm not going to have a public altar call. This is a private issue. And you can be healed without being humiliated. Praise God. So stand on your feet tonight and let's pray and be dismissed. Sunday, I'm going to finish the message, speak to the mountain. I'm already stirred up about it. So don't miss Sunday and uh, bring someone that needs a touch from God. Father, we bless you and thank you tonight for the courage of people like Miss Deborah Griffin. Women who care about women and who are not only willing to say they care, but they've put their words to action and they've reached out and they have been willing to work and labor and try and give money and time, energy and effort. And I thank you for a church, Lord, tonight that I pastor that has put money to light a light in ministries in this community. We don't just curse the darkness, but Lord, we say that we believe in this ministry to not only prevent abortion, but to heal women who've been through this. We know that the love of God covers a multitude of sins. So, Lord, let love always be our theme, always be our motive, always be our agenda. Let us not just want to end abortion to save the life of the child, which is important, but let us want to end abortion to protect the sanity and the health and the beauty of these women that God created and made them with this glorious gift that no man will ever understand, the opportunity to be a mother. Lord, I feel tonight led to pray for those women that may be listening, watching, or may be here who want to be a mother and cannot be. I pray that you would open their womb and that you would give them a child with their husband that they might know the joy of life. We just bless you and thank you tonight for this service and for these people, for their faithfulness and obedience. In Jesus' name. Amen. I know Miss Griffin's available if you want to talk to her, and so are we. I love you. See you Sunday at 9 o'clock.